because um, we're introducing them. We have Janet Mitiki, who is the CEO of Notakea Innovations. And Janet is passionate and visionary, and visionary um, a visionary childcare community activist with over 20 years of experience in ECD lobby advocacy, research, project planning, management, and coordinating um, multidisciplinary um, teams. And her expertise lies in power of play in safeguarding child's, a child's rights in learning institution, as well as empowering women entrepreneurs uh, with skills um, through improving the quality of childcare services. So she has such a um, vast of, um, experience in you know how to innovate when you're looking at arts and play. And she's worked with you know Kidogo, she's worked with World Vision, um, and she was the director um, of pedagogy at Kidogo, where she developed a unique play-based approach that is being used to improve the quality of early learning in Kenya. So we have Janet Mutiki, who will be one of our presenters for today. And we also have um, Cheryl, who is a co-founder and director at Cheza Cheza. And she's passionate about you know, um, innovative education solutions, especially learning that goes beyond the desk and interested in how children can learn resilience and coping skills. Um, she started Cheza Cheza in 2018 with co-founder Franco, who you've just seen, you know, uh, giving us an example of what they take the children through. And she combines her passion for dance and education, um, just at Cheza Cheza. And she comes with, you know, a real life example of how learning through art and play works and how it's impactful for children. Um, yeah, so we'll start a presentation from um, Janet who will sort of like take us through um, a few, you know, pointers when it comes to the role of art and play and what her experience has been. Karibu Janet. So thank you so much, Oz, and good afternoon, everyone. A great pleasure to have all of you, and I thank you for being on board. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to share my experience, hands-on experience on what I have, kind of experience on the field of arts and play, and specifically in the early years. I'm working for an organization called Nyota Care Innovations, and Nyota, it was all about in the early years, the child is a star. And a star is something we are all looking forward to making sure that we protect this child or this star from falling. This is a good picture that shows about play. And definitely it's already defining some of the types of play. Here we have three children who all of them are engaged in play. When they are playing, they are learning. So have that picture in your mind as you move forward with our discussions, and then we'll be able at the end of the session to come back to this picture and discuss about it. Next, Next slide. Yes. Defining early childhood care and development and the critical components that make us call it the early years care and development. I know according to all of us, we have had different definitions of ECD. There are those people who define it as ECDE, -E, Early Childhood Care, Development and Education. This is because we are looking at the holistic development of the child and also looking at how the child is going to learn and using the approach of art and play. When we are looking at the aspect of early childhood care and development, it is more critical for us to think about the brain development. Because researchers have talked about how important it is for us to invest in these early years. And basically, we talk about this putting special emphasis on the first 1,000 days of the child. That is, you know, the mother is pregnant or is expecting. That is the time we start using play and art to be able to stimulate the brain development and the wiring of the neurons in the child's brain at this particular child. So basically, when we talk at, about early components or the critical components, we look at a framework, which is a global framework called the Nurturing Care Framework. And we also look at the five developmental domains that make us to say it is holistic development. When we are looking at the Nurturing Care Framework, we look at how is the health of this particular child that we are looking forward to growing? Also, I think we can go back to that slide so that I can explain briefly. The nurturing care framework. So we look at the health of the child. 
How much does health contribute to the holistic development of the child? How is the mother feeding when she's expectant? How is the child, the baby feeding when the baby is being born? What is the provision of the health services? Issues to do with antenatal, prenatal, and postnatal care of both the expectant mother and also the baby after delivery. So here we are looking at the prenatal, the perinatal, and the postnatal. That is during the pregnancy, during the very period, and also what happens to the health of both the mother, lactating mother, and also to the baby who has born, been born. The feeding, which is adequate nutrition. What is the provision of the nut nutrients or the nutrition of this baby who has been born, uh, born and also the mother? Remember, this is about the stimulation of the brain. The five components are working towards promoting or stimulating the brain, and that is through play that we can be able to work on activities that stimulate the brain. Responsive caregiving. This is about the environment where the mother has got in the baby. How are the caregivers, including us? How do we give to the child? What are we contributing towards the growth and the development of this child? Are we concerned about our voices that we speak to the children? Are we concerned about when the baby is crying? Because most of the times when babies are born and they are young, they communicate through nonverbal communication. When the baby cries, do we respond to the cry and do we identify what cry? The, it is meant for, or what the cry means. The aspect of security and safety. This one is coming so much on the aspect of safeguarding the rights of the child. Once the baby is born, there is the aspect of birth certificate, registration, immunization, and so forth. So what, is, what are we doing as caregivers and also what is the government doing as far as this one is concerned? Last but not least, we have the opportunities to early learning. When does learning start? Remember, we talked about learning does not start when the child is taken to a preschool or to an ECD center, but it starts immediately the baby has been born. When the mother is breastfeeding the baby and holding the baby near the breast, how much does she keep an eye contact? When the baby coos, does the mother respond back to the coos of the baby? And all these nurturing care framework components contribute to the five domains which I talked about, the cognitive development, the physical and the psychomotor, where the health of the child also comes in, the language, the social, and the emotional development of the child. Next. <clears throat> what is the status of ECD in Kenya and in Africa? Indigenously, we know that in Africa, it is said that it takes a village to bring up a child. So in Africa, we believe the bringing up of a child is the responsibility of the entire community. And unfortunately or fortunately, the culture, because of the social economic status of where we are living in, might have evaporated. We have no much village taking care of these children, but that's where now coming back to our Kenyan context, we see that it is a bit minimal because of the decentralization of the communities, people moving from one place to another, and that has brought about how much do we use the indigenous knowledge? That one was used mostly in the African context, but not much in the Kenyan context. Our ECD is aimed at bringing children up using all the knowledge that indigenous, or it's from a cultural setting. Using mother tongue, some people talk about why the mother tongue, also the father tongue, but we can talk about the language that is commonly used in the catchment area so that we don't bring about for kind of a conflict. Our ECD since 2010 has been devolved. Initially, it used to be under the docket of Ministry of Education. But right now, as we talk about ECD in our Kenyan context, it has taken a multi-sectoral approach where we have had different ministries taking different responsibilities. Remember when we look back at the, the nurturing care framework, there is the component of health, that is the component of safety and protection. And that's where we are talking about, it has been devolved from the national level to the county, but also having a multi-sectoral approach in working towards promoting the early learning. Policies. Kenya has the best policies, that's one of the countries that has the best policies for the ECD. It talks about all what we need to do as a country to make sure that our children get the best. Not forgetting the aspect of elaborating or emphasizing on the need of using play 
and act in stimulating and providing learning for these children. Budget allocation, this has been a very big challenge and people are really working towards making it better, but a better, it's a bit better in some counties. Since it was devolved to the county level, some budgetary allocation has improved, but in some counties, not all counties have been able to set budgets. Budgets including the physical structures where the children take the learning, also the payment of the teachers under the capacity building of the caregivers that are teaching in the ECD centers. For many, many years, we have been using the 844 system or the thematic approach. Since 2017, this has been replaced by the CBC, the competency-based curriculum, where we've had children who are now being taught using the CBC to promote different skills and the competencies. And there is no any other way that we can talk about promoting competencies rather than using art and play. That is the best way that is really complementing our CBC in the early years. And I think I talked about the multisectoral approach that the ECD is not just on the MOE alone, but also taken a shift. As I talk about this one, I know we are looking at incorporating play and arts in ECD. How can we be able to teach children literacy and numeracy, but using play? I know most people look at play in our cultural setting like it's a waste of time. Play is the one of the ways that create or promotes the problem solving skills for the children, critical and creative thinking of the children. Why? Because as children talk about use poems, use songs to sing, they may do it like, as they play, they are able to get concepts on literacy. I want to give an example here, like when you use the hopscotch, when they use the stone and draw it to jump from one space to another, they use the word jump, jump to the next, the next, and that is vocabulary, and that is language development. But unconsciously, they are able to promote their literacy and their numeracy skills. As they take turns, they are able to count. Next, it's you, who goes next, the other person. So that's an order, and the order is mathematical, or it's numeracy. They say you come number one, you'll be number two, you'll be number three. And that one has really helped us using play and art to be able to help the children to learn. So incorporating play, using those recycled materials, using the children themselves, and in providing the learning an environment that is stimulating using local materials has been very great in promoting the play in our ECD centers. So we cannot say that we need to use the road counting that we learned some of us in the classroom, but it is about what are the areas that we, were, we are, can be able to promote? First, I think you can just get back briefly. Yes, I want to talk about the case study, the case study that uh, we have applied play-based learning. The case study I'm talking about is of a school in Dandora called Baby Junior Community Center. This self-care center is an inclusive center that accommodates children with learning disabilities. We have physical, autistic, and we also have children who have speech. We have evidently for the last like three years seen how the power of play has been able to stimulate the learning of children with disabilities. Remember, these are children who you cannot just bring books and the parents to tell them to read and write. But using play, like using sand, like this group of children where they are, and also using the local materials like superiors, and uh, interacting with the children who are regular. We don't say the ones who are normal. Everyone is as is or our own challenge. So children who interact with children who are regular in an inclusive setting using play have been able, some of them come without speech. As they play and interact with the materials, they have been able to come their speech, to promote speech. They have been able to build their social skills. Now, because they really wanted to be alone or by themselves, they have been able to interact with others. The regular children have been able to understand their emotions. So children with special needs using play have been able to express their emotions and also control their own emotions. That's one thing I can say. In the first picture, those are children also, and some of them have their physical disability or disabilities. But use of local resources like the yarn, sewing, in together with the other 
such use of those play materials and recycled play materials. And that's one of the biggest challenge, big successes that we have had. These materials are not bought, but even some of the times the parents come on the ground and are able to develop the materials or they come with the materials that are at home so that the children can be as able to associate a transition from home to school and from school to home. Then how can we be able to incorporate play in our homes and schools? The next slide is practicing art and uh, play activities at home and at school. You cannot tell people to play when you are not able to become a player or to play you yourself. When uh, Cheza Cheza or Franco was doing that music, we had to dance so that somebody else can be able to follow the rhythm. So in the same thing as a caregiver, and we talk about both biological and also professional caregivers, we say it's important for you to provide a schedule. Inside the time the children are learning, they're doing other activities. It is good for you to have like 15 minutes, 20 minutes at home and play with your child. A pediatrician talked and said, play is a free drug that each of us would want to take. So if it is a drug that is not hurting, if you do exercise and you play, you are able to get your health good. What would hinder us from making a schedule for our own children is both in the STD centers and at home. Allow children time to play. Yes, we have so much like homeworks, write-ups and so forth, but that is not what is important. The children can also be able to do play and other art activities. You can give them activities that they can be able to express their ideas. Play and art makes us to understand what is in the mental health of the child and what the child is thinking about. So we have been able also to use like uh, this playtime by giving children materials to play. And whenever we see the child, what comes from the child's mind is what is put on the paper or it is put in the activity. So that makes us be more calm or kind of a concentrative on what play does. So allow time for children to play. And in most cases, we say play is a vehicle. So when the child is driving that vehicle, he may concentrate more time than you had scheduled. So be, have some flexibility. Provide safe and stimulating environment. You may provide an environment that is not stimulating. We cannot term play as play when there are no manipulatives. There are no things to use their senses, to touch, to feel, to smell, to manipulate. So when you are providing a safe and stimulating environment, play materials must be available and play materials that are relevant to the age and play materials that are kind of a familiar to the child to be able to associate himself with. We talk about be a core player. Don't stand and give directions. Be the first person to lead in the play. Show the child the interest. Become a child. In play and art, we talk about you becoming a child. You go down to the level of the child. Don't stand. When you talk about responsive caregiving, we tell caregivers to go down, sit on the floor with the child and reach the child's eye level. Children learn better when you have that eye contact and you are able to see each other. So those are some of the things that you as a caregiver, both professional and also biological, you can be able to promote play. Remember, we do not need to buy materials at all. Materials are packed in our families. We have the empty containers made of, of mafuta. We have the packets of wunga. We have all those kinds of materials. Those are recycled materials, the stones, the sticks, all those collections of those materials. Let's recycle them and make them a play activity for our children. Otherwise, thank you so much. And one of the things I can say is if we can get a free drug to promote the learning of our children, both regular and the children with disabilities, what can hinder us not to go for that? Let's go for play and art, and that will make our children be deep in our community. Thank you. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, that's a very insightful sort of background you've given around just the genesis of, you know, ECD and where learning starts and how art, art and play can come along the way. Thank you so much for that. So we'll dive right into presentation by Cheryl from Cheza Cheza. And then after that, we'll have a panel discussion. So Cheryl, over to you. Thank you, Rose, for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Oh. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, again, my name is Sherelle and I'm the co-founder of Together with Franco from Chiza Chiza and also the director of Chiza Chiza. 
Um, I hope that this presentation will give you some tools, ideas, and inspire you to uh, stimulate holistic development uh, as a caregiver or as a teacher. Um, so I wanted to share a question that Franco and I asked ourselves before starting to the CHISA. And we wanted to think about a world um, that we imagined could be. So we thought about what if every child was able to develop essential social and emotional skills in a safe and playful learning environment that helped them to improve school performance, manage emotions, but also thrive in life. Um, we wanted to create an education solution that focused on the whole child, um, also connecting to their culture and stimulate lifelong learning. And that's where arts and play came in. Um, so, we are going to meet Chiza Chiza with the next slide. Um, Chiza Chiza means uh, playful in Swahili. And what we do is we deliver social and emotional learning. And we do that through the transformative power of dance and movement. I also say movement because people are like, I cannot dance, but I'll show you what you can do because everyone can move. Um, so we do that in a community-led after-school dance programs um, for at-risk children. And we mainly work in informal settlements um, across Nairobi. Um, so I'll break it down uh, a little bit because maybe it's a hard to read sentence. Um, so one of the most important parts of our work is that we use dance and movement-based learning to build social and emotional skills. And we've created a special curriculum that incorporates dance therapy, meditation, mindfulness um, that we implement in community and schools. So we stimulate playful learning uh, through movement. Um, the second part is that we leverage the power of the community. So we find local role models uh, that are change makers in their community, and we train them in our curriculum, in our methods, and we enable them to set up a Chiza Chiza dance program in their community um, and in schools. Um, and you ask maybe what's the benefit uh, of dance and why did we choose dance? Um, well, Franco is a wonderful dancer. Uh, I am also a dancer. I don't know uh, if I'm at the level of Franco, um, but we felt the, the benefits of dance, uh, but there's a whole theory why dance and movement is so powerful in learning. So when we looked at the issues uh, in the communities that we worked, we saw, we saw different things. A lot of trauma and stress that's, uh, sometimes uh, overlooked. Um, there is abuse within the household, outside of the household, stressful environment with violence, um, with sometimes situations that a child should not be in or should witness, which gives a lot of uh, stress um, within the child. Um, then there's little time to play and be a child. So first of all, there's a lack of public spaces um, where safe playing is induced. So uh, think about these playgrounds um, that we don't really find uh, in the communities that we work. Um, and when the child grows a little bit older, so primary and secondary school age, um, the child has to do chores, um, has to take care of their siblings, and there's actually not really that much time to be a child, play, relax, and have fun. Um, and another thing is that there's a lack of soft skills in the school curriculum. Jenna touched upon the competency-based curriculum that we have in Kenya. And unfortunately, that's not always implemented. Teachers are not trained. They don't have the capacity or the time in their classes. So the child doesn't develop all aspects of itself, but really it's focused on academic performance. So all in all, challenging environment, and it can lead to lower school engagement. Um, we see that children are not really excited to go to school. It's not fun. It's not engaging. Um, we see that if stress is unanswered, increased violence and criminal behavior occurs, um, and accelerated school dropouts. So if we combine social emotional learning and dance, um, we think we have a wonderful combination. So what dance or play uh, does stimulate cognitive, social, and emotional development. Um, so it develops a wide range of skills. Like Janet said, problem solving, creative thinking, um, how to collaborate one another. Um, we dance a lot in groups. We do group work. You have to learn a choreography. Um, how can you express yourself? Dance is a wonderful tool 
to express your emotions. Um, so you also get that uh, part of emotional development. Then dance also releases a lot of stress and trauma. And that's where dance therapy comes in. Our curriculum uh, incorporates dance therapy, meditation and mindfulness. And so it's a great way for kids to really relax and de-stress in our classes. And we just create creative thinkers with a growth mindset. And I want just the emphasis to move away from just academics, but also the development of different aspects of the child that actually can help the child have better academic performance, but also have lower um, emotional uh, distress, um, hopefully reduce uh, dropout rates um, and way more benefits uh, that come from social emotional learning and dance. And you might think, how do we achieve these outcomes? Because you're, you're dancing, how does a Chesa Chesa class look like? Well, we build um, a seven step structure in our class. So we give children the joy of experiencing dance. So being playful, having fun in our classes while at the same time working on building those skills. So I would love to take you through the seven steps or seven elements of our class. And I hope you take away some, some practical exercises that you could do as a caregiver or teacher. And at the end, I will come back because you don't have to be a dancer to implement what we do. So we start with the circle of trust in our classes. Um, we stand together, children and teacher, to create a circle of safety uh, and create equality. In the circle of trust, we share norms, we share values, and what the class is going to look like. Then we do a meditation exercise, just like Franco, that helps the kids to breathe to let go and to really connect with their emotions. Then after the emotion check-in, we ask the children to express how they feel. And we don't ask for words, but we ask for movement. In a class, if you would ask, how are you feeling? And this is what we had in the beginning of Chiza Chiza. We heard, poa, 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 I'm okay, I'm okay. But when you actually see 30 different children move around the classroom, everybody expresses themselves very uniquely. Then we could see, hey, a child is stressed, a child is shy, a child is excited. Um, so sometimes their emotional vocabulary doesn't really match what they're trying to express and movement can be that outlet. Then we go on to movement-based learning. And this, this is, uh, I think, really great and shows how you can learn skills through movement. So one of the classes that we do is on self-esteem. We put on music and we ask the kids walk around with high self-esteem. So you see them walking around with high self-esteem and we you know, really stimulate them to express themselves. We also ask them walk around with low self-esteem. So you see them sometimes slouching, sometimes looking to the ground. And we ask them, how did that feel? What did you see in your peers? How did the energy change in the room? And for us, we really see that certain things like self and feel it. So that's one example of movement-based learning. Then we go on to dance therapy where we move, we relax, and then um, we do more the traditional uh, dance part. We learn dance techniques, dance steps. We work in small groups where the children co-create movements and do storytelling through uh, dance moves that they learn, uh, mainly on uh, modern African uh, music, so Afro beats. Then we cool down again with the meditation, stretching, um, and we do a reflection uh, at the end where we think, what did we learn and how can we use this in uh, our daily life? And it's also always uh, better to show two stories or a story of uh, what the children experience to really show the impact of our work. Um, so we have uh, Angela and Vincent, um, and I have two quotes on the slides um, about them. Uh, Angela was really struggling with her confidence and she learned from a friend, um, you know, there's this program, Chisa Chisa, they work on confidence and she thought she would join and she's really blossomed into 
public speaking and showing herself and performing. And it's really wonderful to watch. A lot of our Chiza Chiza kids, um, we now reach over 500 every week in communities and schools. Um, and what we see is that our children are self-aware, confident, and know how to express themselves, creative thinkers. Um, Vincent is one of our younger uh, students that have been with us since the beginning. He grew up in an abusive household, running away, getting into conflict with his parents. And through Chiza Chiza, he is more self-aware, knows how to manage his emotions and his relationship with his parents really improved, um, which we are like very proud that we could create that with them. So again, do you think you need to be a dancer to implement some of the exercises? Um, I listed some of the exercises um, for ECD and primary and secondary. You can always reach out if you want to know more. Um, so the emotion check-in that we did with Franco, you can do that with your very young child, with your teenager, um, ask how they feel, express it in a move. And again, like Janet said, be a co-player. Don't just ask your kid, do it yourself as well and do it together and, and share. Um, follow the leader. The teacher can put on music and do a move and the children have to follow. Even the children can be a leader and you don't have to be a dancer. You can just use movement. Um, the make an animal, make a shape. You can put on music and ask uh, the kids to express an animal, express a shape. Um, you can stop the music, ask them to freeze and to put two fingers up in the air or three, or ask them to express a letter in their, uh, with their body. And then you can stimulate these literacy and numeracy skills uh, as well with music and dance. Uh, to wind up, um, we can tell a story. Um, maybe your teenager comes home, you ask about how their day was, they don't want to say anything, but if you can ask them to express it in a move or tell a story, then sometimes hands up in the air, something comes up, but at least there's, you know, a way to communicate uh, with, your, with your child or with your student. Like I said, walking around with high self-esteem, um, putting on music, expressing emotions through dance, really just having uh, a fun time um, expressing different emotions uh, through movement. So that's a little bit about hopefully what you can take away as a caregiver or a teacher. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Cheryl, for that. Um, it's very interesting and informative how um, like relevant a play is like for our children and for learners and and I think even learners at all ages because I remember um, Franco came to our office once and he took us through now I'm realizing he actually took us through that model of you know uh, tell a story through dance and put music and be like okay tell a story and I was like wow that's a very interesting way of making me think outside the box and figure out how am I going to, to tell this story through dance moves, you know? It makes you actually really think. So it's, yeah, thank you for sharing that. So we are moving on to, um, we'll combine the panel discussion and the Q&A because of time. And um, just to maybe kickstart the discussion is around, just you've given us the tools, you've given us the statistics, you've given us your experiences. Um, so for, for, for example, if you're looking at a parent or a caregiver or a teacher or a school owner, where would you say is a place to start when you're thinking about arts and play? Maybe I haven't been doing this or I have been doing this, but where do I really, where do you think I, I, I should start um, even tomorrow, for example, to do this? Um, and maybe each of you can give us a, a response. We can start with you, Janet. Uh, thank you so much, Rose. I, I don't think we can talk about going tomorrow. We can talk about going today. After yeah. we leave this session, <laughs> people can start thinking about doing play. And for me, uh, through experience, I have seen like the best way to start is, like I said, even when the mother is pregnant, start the play by touching the tummy and talking to their baby. Play comes automatically. Like uh, I, the, some of the things, our characteristics with children's play, there is always joy. 
and they are engaged. So whenever there is joy and the child is happy, it makes like the emotions, the other developmental domains come out automatically. So don't start like, uh, start with what you have in hand, yourself, the song that you have, the cultural song that you learned from your early years. So we can start from there. And above that, like Charela said, visit places where learning through play starts in the early years. Let us not wait until the, probably they become because they start identifying themselves. It is critical because when you start it early, that is the time the window of opportunity is open. And once it closes after the five years, your opportunity for the learning may not be as stimulating as it could have worked in the early years. So we like, not just say like we did in Yota, but some people are asking about inclusivity. I have evidently seen the power of play in children with disabilities because they are like, they love doing and they love doing what they love and what they love makes them succeed. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know if I've asked, answered your question. Thank you. Uh, yes, you, you have. Um, Cheryl, what are your thoughts? Where do I start um, today? Janet has said today, not tomorrow, today. Yeah, no, I think as adults, we might think, like you said, inside the box and we're like, okay, what do I do? And I think my tip was co-create with your kids or students. Probably your students and your children are way more playful. So ask them what... working with your students and working um, with your child and get ideas from them and then do it together. So um, if you're overwhelmed, um, get, I yeah, get ideas together. Uh, second of all, it doesn't have to be resource intensive. Like Janet said, you can put on music, you can um, yeah, throw a stone and you can hop on a playground. Um, you can play hide and seek. There's a lot of things um, you can do. So um, don't think it will cost a lot of resources. Think about co-creating with the people around you, with your team of teachers, with your partner, um, and with, with your kids. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we'll move into one of the questions that came from Anna Martin, um, where she says, thanks for touching on children with disabilities. I wonder if you or anyone here have explored the impact of play-based learning on deaf learners who use Kenyan sign language yet. Um, this is something that Ikitab is exploring. Um, any thoughts on uh, play-based learning uh, for deaf, deaf learners? Maybe Janet, you can, you can start as well on this one. No, for for the deaf, uh, I think the ones I have had a, a touch or an experience with is the autistic children, the speech the, and the physical. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones I have had, but for the deaf, not really, not much interaction. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I love the idea of introducing us to the Ikita. It would be a good idea for us to know what they do and what happens. It's good for us to learn from them too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Cheryl, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would like to invite Franco, even if it's just for uh, 30 seconds, Franco, because um, we work together with uh, Paukwa to create uh, a Kenyan alphabet, um, like in, in, in moves, like the A's for avocado, the B, and it was really uh, fun to, to do. But one thing that was really special is that we use sign language in the dance. Um, so Franco knows, Franco can uh, maybe briefly talk about that even though maybe it's not the music, deaf children and movement really go uh, well together. Mm -hmm. Franco, maybe you can touch on that briefly on the experience you had with um, deaf ladders. Franco, are you? I don't know if he's still in the call. I think he might have stepped out. Oh, he might have stepped out, okay, okay. Um, when it comes back, we can sort of circle back on that. Okay. Yeah, but happy to, to connect because it's uh, it's definitely possible. Yeah, and um, I guess also because the um, deaf learners and I interacted with the deaf, I've interacted with the deaf community quite a bit. They do hear the beats and like the vibration. It's the vibration, the vibration. Yeah. And so definitely. what you're saying is like incorporating 
the actions and the movement and, and the vibrations, I think it also gives them um, a better experience in terms of, of learning. But yes, we can definitely check out um, Ikitabu and what their experience you know, ways of collaborating on that as well. Um, yeah. We have another question from Jennifer Otieno, and this is um, directed to Janet. Um, do you think there is a role that technology can play in facilitating more play and arts in ECD, both in and out of school? Do you think there is a role that technology can play in facilitating more play and arts in ECD, both in and out of school? So looking at technology and, um, and play. Definitely, I think that's the way to go because these children are will be growing in a, up in a global and we are looking at the 21st century and the play is one of the approaches that would really help us to achieve the, 20, the SDGs and the 21st century as well. In fact, one of the things last uh, week we had some learning with ACD children with disabilities and it was so funny like more of their interest was on the gadgets. They were like not interested on in doing the activities on the ground, but touching and the feeling the gadgets and playing with that. So that shows like the need and the gap that has been there. So for me, I would really, really, I've always loved and seen like how the technology would really help us to achieve what we, more, it can accelerate what we could achieve in the learning of these children. So that one can work very well. Okay, okay. Cheryl, do you have any thoughts on technology and play in learning? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not familiar myself, uh, but I think it can be a great addition and avenue. So I, I don't think technology should replace, but I think it's a great uh, addition. Um, so playing certain games, I know uh, Kukua with um, their um, uh, Super Sema. They of yeah. course have the YouTube, but they also have, um, I think, literacy and numeracy games. So mm -hmm. a gaming um, for young children through this app can can be wonderful. So I think it's a it's it's a great new avenue, and we have to think a lot of kids are just on on, on phones. So why not use that as a tool for learning uh, than instead like a passive way of just watching something. Yeah, and I like what you said about um, it has to be, of course, a balance. Um, we can incorporate technology, but also we can see what other ways we can, you know, we can be outside, but also how does, you know, like the super semas or the apps that, you know, help with literacy, numeracy, and which are numerous in the market. Um, but it's almost like creating a balance to help a child learn from the different, you know, platforms that are available, um, both just from, a gadget, but also outside um, the, the gadget. So I like what you said around the, the balance aspect. Um, so looking at this morning, I, I was, there's a group of moms that are mean and um, someone was mentioning how they went to um, a morgue and they were told that there have been, in the last two weeks, there have been an average of two suicides per day. Um, and it's young people, like between, let's say, like at late teens and early 20s. Um, and so my question is around how do you incorporate, because learning never stops, how do you reach out to, um, to young people? Um, because they are very close, they don't want to, you know, open up, they are, they just want to stay to themselves. How do you how can you use learning um, through arts and play if that's you know applicable to sort of help them to open up and share some of these the struggles that they're facing because mental health is you know is a big issue um in this country at this point so um, what are your thoughts around you know how you can get a child teenager or you know young person to to open up but using you know play at home or in class because sometimes you have um students in class who are not who are like very very close how would you yeah approach that situation yeah, I, I think it's very important to include the arts because art is such a great way of expression. So of course we work with dance, but I also want to highlight uh, painting, um, make, uh, making music. We have a wonderful organization called Ghetto Classics. Um, and I think, I don't know them yet, but um, Drawing Initiative um, is also uh, connected to Metis. So it's like a dance. You don't have to use your words, but if you, feel stressed and is stored in your body, dance can be a great outlet. And let's not 
start too late, but if we incorporate it already in ECD and um, arts and play in, in the curriculum, it can be something that kids actually use to vent uh, their feelings and express their feelings. And same with, with drawing, with art and painting and making music, if that's part of the curriculum, then it's, it's, it's an outlet for them. And then hopefully it doesn't have to come that far that the mental health issues become so big resulting mm -hmm. in the suicides that, that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any thoughts, Janet, on that? Um... Yes, my thinking is uh, in most cases, research says that uh, if the window of opportunity closes at the first five years, there is a small window that may open between the pre and adolescent. And that is why the young guys and young boys want to have that identity crisis. And that is where we have like, the biggest challenge when we want to tackle that. And to my thinking is, uh, I've been uh, working with some girls who are 11 to 10, 11 and 12. And the use of play is like giving them an opportunity to be like a, to initiate, you, you don't take like the lead, but you provoke their thinking, like introducing a particular game or mm -hmm. even giving them an opportunity to share their stories about their life up to where they are. So when you give them like the stories when you talk about the drawing and the painting or acting out like a, a drama, it really gives out the bringing out of what the child is going through or what probably could still or play and promote. So I think that is a great opportunity. But remember, for me, I'm a believer like those very early years. But if by any chance we miss that opportunity now, we should be able to think about this small window that opens in the pre and adolescent and kind of be able to infuse that whatever we may not have had at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Thank you for that. We have a question from Amos Otunga who says, um, so this starts with the parent, stroke teacher, stroke educator. Do you have resources for them? Um, there, there are many resources online. I know that there's the Lego Foundation and their whole um, um, initiative is to learn through play. And they have a lot of online resources, for example, uh, that you can, you can uh, pick from and a lot of them are also really resource limited so that you don't have to use a lot of materials so that is a good mm -hmm. one but I would love to share more uh, after this call some websites yep. um, yeah great so yeah we'll share an email just after I mean uh, tomorrow or on Monday we'll um, we'll share uh, resources that you can utilize just to be yeah, to make it practical for you. Um, we have a, a comment from Dominic. Um, great presentations. How do you fit Cheza Cheza into the school routine? And what is your long-term goal? That is, how do you plan to influence policy? Well, the goal is to have Cheza Cheza implemented in every school in Kenya. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the goal. Yeah. Um, but we both work in communities and in schools. So we're an after-school program that works in communities, but also in schools. So now um, we come into schools as an extracurricular activity. So really it's like a, a supplement to the curriculum, but um, in the long term, uh, I think it's great if some of our exercises, like I said, you don't need to be a dancer, but can inc be incorporated um, at the start of the day or um, be done uh, by teachers as part of the competency-based um, curriculum. But I would love to chat more uh, with you after. Awesome. Thank you for that. So we are going to wrap up this session and maybe you can post. Sorry, yes. Rose, can I add on something? I'm not Cheza Cheza, yes. but my feeling is yes, you can like, add. <laughs> like the CBC is so much into these competencies. And uh, these are the competencies that we need because it is not a must that our children be straight air performers. But if we have a talent that we identify in the children, like probably that joy of the play and dance and art then mm. why, can't, why can't the teacher be able to nurture and the parent nurture this talent through that dance and through the art and the play so that the policy, if it had not incorporated that, we should be able to push and see how can the policy makers understand this is an approach, this is a, a route that can help the CBC to be implemented like, or actualize the dream of the CBC, my thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so we'll just have like uh, closing remarks from both of you. What is your last 
sort of word to the to the audience um, this afternoon regarding the topic of learning through arts and play. Um, I hope that uh, every person, caregiver or teacher sees that play is very important, arts is very important, and that it can help to develop a child in multiple ways and set them up for life. So it's a great foundation. And like Janet said, I don't want to steal your words, but don't start uh, tomorrow, start today. You can do it even tomorrow, bring a speaker or even your phone, put on music and just start having fun uh, in the classroom or at home. Awesome, thank you. Janet, your parting shot. My parting shot is like, we need to change the perception from the community because we grew up in a community where we thought play is a way of wasting time. But for we as educationists and change makers and innovators, we have seen the power of play in uh, stimulating holistic development in our children. Let's mm -hmm. start by changing where we are ourselves as we move to the next person. So let's change the perception. Let's emulate, let's embrace play. No other, I said, if it is a free drug, sincerely, why should we go and pay expensively when we can use our free drug and get healed and get good health? Let's start mm -hmm. from there. Let's go start playing ourselves and then we'll be able to replicate it to the community, caregivers and the children. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you as well. Um, Betty, yes, we can engage further after the session. Um, and we can share the contacts of the panelists and you can even further the discussion with them. I've seen your question and your comment. So we are moving into another session now um, where we'll break, do breakout rooms for about, um, say, uh, like five minutes, um, five, five to eight minutes. And um, in your breakout rooms, we'll have three people per group. And in your groups, you introduce yourself um, and you can share how you are going to practice what you have learned today at home or in school or um, in community settings. Yes, hi everyone. I am Amos based in Nairobi. I work with the Mshule Limited. This is a mobile educational platform that uses SMS and AI to administer learning content to the learners. My biggest takeaway as a learning designer, how am I going to incorporate art and play into my content. It's a big challenge for me. Thanks a lot for this session. Thank you for sharing, Amos. Um, wishing you all the best as you figure that out, because yeah, I'm sure you you find um, ways to, to do that. Um, anyone else, one more person to just share a key takeaway from today's session before I pick you? Let's see. I can go ahead. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so what I shared in our group was um, something very important Planet had mentioned. Um, I think when she was talking about how like uh, being a co-player as an adult, or, I mean, as a caregiver, um, involves like coming down to the child's level and using your imagination and all that. I think the thing that stuck with me most was the um, being creative with what you have around you because kids really don't need the special toys that we think of every day. Like they don't need you to go to Toy World and spend 17, 60,000. They don't know the value of a toy. And it's very easy to just like make a car out of like you know, the bottle tops and the matchbox sticks and, you know, all that. And an example I shared in the group was how, like when we're in primary school, mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to play a game, you didn't have to carry toys to school. Most of us aren't even allowed to carry toys. So you just take scrap paper and you make a jet, you make a chatterbox, you make a boat. And for the rest of the day, that's a full game. That's are several games. Even the competition of who could make the better jet was a game in itself. And like for a child that enhances your creativity, there's so much playtime, you can be so unique about it. You learn how to take care of your toys because taking care of paper is not that much fun. 
Um, so I, I think that was a very major one that stuck with me that resources are not something that should stop us from play because a huge part of play is imagination. So if we can be creative and imaginative with what we actually have around us, then we can enhance play a lot more and just bring it into our day to day for the kids. Amazing, amazing. So good to hear that. I think my biggest takeaway is that I can I can start now. I mean, I can I don't have to wait until tomorrow. Like I can go home today and you know do a simple activity, an emotional check-in or telling a story, allow the kids to tell a story. So it's literally, I can start from here now um, with what I have. So that's um, one key takeaway for me. So um, as we close, we have a couple of announcements. We have our fellowship application um, window open um, and it will close on uh, 2nd of April. Um, so encourage you know, education innovators who are um, looking at uh, innovations in education to, um, to apply. And the four areas that um, are a focus for this year, um, I think Natalie, you can highlight what those four areas are. Yes, uh, so for this year, um, we are actually looking for innovators working in ECD or innovating in ECD and traditional skills. Uh, we are looking at teacher training and professional development. Uh, we are looking at climate resilience and finally we are looking at um, the innovators that are helping uh, our learners or sorry <laughs> um, so let me do that again uh, i think yeah, i got i got it far forward so we are doing ecd uh, and, and and traditional skills we are doing climate resilience okay we are doing teacher training and development so those are innovating to even help our teachers figure out uh, how to uh, tackle the CBC and how to incorporate even some of the lessons that uh, have been shared here today uh, within our classrooms or within our learning environment. Then we would want to see you actually apply and become part of uh, part of the Metrics Fellowship. Uh, so please do uh, do submit your application, and we'll be very happy uh, to see you innovating in these areas that. Um, I've actually liked it. I, I've dropped a link on the chat box. So have a look at it, click, go to our website, and you'll be able to learn more about um, the Metrics Fellowship. We also have an upcoming uh, Q&A session that we'll be doing next week on Thursday. Um, let me drop the link also on the chat and you can sign up and join us to learn more about the fellowship. Amazing. So you can send the link to your friends, to your networks, for those you know are innovating in these areas and you know this would be a helpful opportunity for them so feel free to share so thank you so much everyone for taking time to come onto this session and learn about you know how to incorporate arts and play in you know in the learning environment um we'll see you in the next event which will be communicated for now we'll send you an email after this um event with all the resources that you had asked about um yeah and see you in the next event Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.